record. All right, we're good to go. Uh, Vishal, thanks for picking this up today. Um, Vishal's um, covering for me because um, I've not really made an awful lot of progress on a, a materialist, although I did do some today. I've um, ran the, over the last 24 hours, I've ran um, another probably 12 epochs um, through the full data set and I've generated the masks that um, we need for um, processing the full data set. Um, so it's uh, burnt about 24 hours of uh, full uh, KAT GPU. Uh, I didn't go for the expensive one because they weren't available. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, I think I'm running low on uh, uh, Google Cloud Platform credits now. Uh, but I figure probably what I'll do is I'll take that and uh, share the masks with everyone so they don't have to generate them because took about, I would have said about five or six hours to generate all the masks um, and it's, um, it's CPU bound. So, but there, I don't think there's any way I could really have sped it up. So I just, um, I loaded it onto a smaller um, instance and ran it that way. Okay, um, so Vishal is going to take us through um, Efficient Net. Um, I had a quick look at the paper earlier. It's uh, quite interesting stuff. Um, Vishal, are you going to give us an overview of how um, Efficient Net works as well as the um, code? Yeah, 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 I'll go through a bit, not like in depth, because yeah, there's still some things in that that I don't understand really well. But yeah, just general idea of it. So yeah. Uh, right. Uh, so my introduction was to fast AI. So I started in doing this food 101 thing just when we started doing food thingy. But but I was like, I'll stick to this thing for longer. And as Jeremy says, like do one problem, like finish one problem properly. <laughs> so like uh, I'll, I'll try to beat, if I, I'll try if I can beat the uh, current state of an art. So that's what I was trying from last, whenever like we tried doing food, I think it's been like five weeks or six weeks, something like that. So uh, I, I started with simple Inception V3 in Keras, uh, but that wasn't going anywhere for me because I, it, but there was a lot of learning in that too, but I was not able to uh, get to the accuracy which I was trying to get to. Uh, but then in fast AI, uh, directly jumping into the best, which are now like efficient net, uh, which we can see in paper with code. So. Uh, you might be aware about this website where they publish all the latest papers and state of an art results. So you can go for like image classification and, and, and different type of medical data set, metallurgical graphs, all kinds of different things. And what are the best results right now? So there is for one for food one and 101 as well. Oh, no, sorry, not this one. Mm. Yeah. Oops. It comes under fine grain problems. Food one on one. Yeah, here it is. So there are some data sets which are, comes under fine grained image classification. Food one on one is one of those. There are like cars data set, flights data set, and some other data sets which they are called fine grain because there's not much difference between classes. A lot of food items look very similar. Uh, and similarly with cars and aeroplanes. So it's not like diverse data sets. So they have like a separate category for this. So right now the best results, which I saw were like uh, for efficient at B7. And this is the paper from where I got, about, got to know about the paper. Uh, but more importantly, uh, as Jeremy also says in like most of his videos on past year, that most of the things that these super high and uh, this latest research paper do, we can do it with ResNet as well. ResNet is like really good when it comes to image classification. So instead of like directly jumping into efficient net, uh, I tried doing something with ResNet as well. Uh, and to be honest with ResNet 152, I was, I was able to get accuracy of 91%, uh, which is like pretty close to it. Uh, and, but if you go to the paper and see what they are claiming about, 
when they tried ResNet 152, what results they got? For food 101, it is. So these are like different uh, fine grain data sets, like BirdSnap, Stanford Cars, Flas. So here's the food. And if you see in the food, ResNet 152 is the star. And they are claiming like with the ResNet 152, they were able to get only 87% accuracy this team. But, but uh, I was able to get somewhere here, even better than all these, not as good as G-pipes, uh, but G-pipes are like, they, they take crazy amount of parameters, like uh, G-pipes, which are the best before efficient at B7 came for food 101. They took 556 million parameters, which is, which is a lot. Uh, you, you need some good infrastructure to run, run the G pipes. Uh, but, uh, and then that's what efficient net is trying to do here. So what I'll do today is I'll go through my ResNet part as well, a bit of things that I did, uh, which helped me to get to the 91% on ResNet. Uh, and efficient net code, the whole efficient net code, which allowed me to jump over these best results. Uh, so I trained it on B4, efficient net B4, and they got 91.5. And I was able to get like 91.8% on efficient net B4. And efficient net B7, it's still running, <laughs> uh, but it looks promising. And I think I'll be able to beat 93% as well. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it is taking a lot of time. Like each epoch takes three and a half hours. So uh, I'll, I'll go through the code. Like we can do a bit of coding and I'll, instead of going, uh, okay, I'll not go to the ResNet one. I'll just start doing the code here, uh, which I use for EfficientNet. And the things which I use in the ResNet thing were also in EfficientNet. Some tweaks, which I'll mention. Like what are those? So uh starting with a uh, simple checking our processes and my gpu so we need some good gpus if you are running uh, efficient net so efficient, uh, efficient net from B0 to B, it's like, sorry, efficient had different categories. So it, it has like, it goes from B0 to B7. So what are these? Uh, to understand those, we have to go and see uh, the paper again. So what efficient net tells is that, in, that usually what we do is like to improve the accuracy, either we increase the resolution of the images, or we go deeper in the network. So, uh, but there is no standard way of telling like how much deep you should go, what resolution you should use. And there is one more thing called widening the network, uh, which was a paper came in 2017, which claimed that instead of going deeper and deeper into the network, you can actually wide the network, which means like you can increase the number of feature maps. So it, uh, this, what it does, it, it, it gives you same kind of accuracy as like deeper networks, but with very sh shallow number of layers, like maybe 16 or 17 layers, which performs equal to ResNet 50. But the number of uh, features which you use, which maps you use, like they increase four times. So what EfficientNet tells that uh, we take all these three things and we tell you uh, that how you should scale these three things to get the best results. So they came out with a equation of how, how you should scale your model in terms of both uh, depth, width, and resolution. So that's what they are talking about here. Let me see where it is. Yep, these parameters. And so when I started, so I started doing it with the basic form of efficient net which is like 224 is pixel and and also resnet underneath the res uh, sorry efficient net they take mobile net or resnet architecture and then use these uh techniques of increasing the depth width and resolution upon the or already uh, present archi underlying architectures like mobile net and resnets 
So they take either mobile net and ResNets and they just modify them so that how depth, width, and resolution should be increased. And that's how we get efficient net. And they give a good comparison as well, but. Um, so is it almost like automating the approach Jeremy was showing us, but um, where we trained on a smaller network? Yes, yes. So that's what it does. So and so we usually like on a smaller images, uh, the network generalizes really well. And uh, so what we do is we usually when we train our ResNets, we train it on let's say two twenty four mega twenty four by two twenty four pixels images, and we get like really good results. And then we move on to 512 by 512 results, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, pixel images, and we can improve the performance from there on. And also we go deeper, like first we use ResNet 50 and try to go ResNet 100 and ResNet 150 to see uh, how the performance is increasing and performance actually increases. But here they're saying like, it's the same thing, but we do it for you. And, and there's like a certain value according to which you should scale these things. Uh, a good, uh, so like when, when I first read it, so I couldn't understand like what's these exact values, how you should scale those. So there's actually someone on fast AI forum. Uh, if can, uh, if I can write it faster. On forum, someone actually mentioned how you should choose your parameters. So here it's someone actually gave this example it says like when you're using efficient at b0 the scale so one is 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 just telling like this is your base network and you're using 224 by 224 images and 0 0.2 percent like 20 percent is the dropout rate within the network but if you go from b0 to b4 so the depth sorry width of your network increases by 1.4 times depth increases by 1.8 times your resolution should go from 224 to 380 and your dropout should go from 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. So that was really helpful for me. So I, I, I did uh, go through, like I, I tried values according to these, uh, but as this guy also says at the bottom, but in my experience going with the B0 with higher resolution also helps as it, as in ResNet. So we are using a smaller network, but we are, increasing the resolution. So instead of using 224, I use B0, but I use 512. And there was like a drastic change in uh, performance again. So the network, uh, network trained really fast because it was very small network, but because the resolutions were high, still we got like uh, the accuracy jump from 82 to 88 or 89, something like that. So that was like good jump and uh, quite surprising. But one thing that surprised me was when I was doing the same thing on ResNet, as I said, I took ResNet 152 and I trained it on 224 by 224 images. I got like, let's say 86% accuracy. And then I transferred the learning from 224, 224 to 512 by 512. So the accuracy increased. But in the case of efficient net, I took B0 and I trained it on 224 by 224 and then try to transfer the learning to another B0 with image resolution of 512 by 512, but there wasn't any significant change. Uh, so that was like one of the surprising thing for me. But uh, also we, I need to dig a bit, uh, bit more into the code, uh, which was written because efficient net doesn't officially come with the fast air library yet. Uh, it's, it's, it's a third party implementation, someone wrote it, uh, but, but we can use it quite fine with fast air. Uh, and the third part is, uh, I think I have the thing. So, so that's the Git repo for efficient net code. And it's basically pretty simple. You just pip install efficient net PyTorch and you just do uh, import efficient net and just, and you tell like, so you tell whether you want the pre-tained B0 or like B0, B1, B3, which we saw here, which which efficient net version you want and and do you want pre-trained or not? So uh, pre-trained is they train it on, uh, I think, Cypher 100 or, or ImageNet competition data set. And 
so we get the uh, pre-trained efficient net network from that so i think that's pretty much the idea of efficient is you can go from b0 to b7 and um, with every time you increase uh, go from b0 to like to the next stage of the uh, efficient net the depth width and resolution increases and so does the performance but it's still because we are widening and increasing the resolution uh, so it creates a perfect balance of all these things and because of this uh, we get like state of an art results with like way significantly lower number of parameters so you see gpi 557 million parameters was used efficient net b7 just takes 66 million parameters which is like 8.4 times smaller than the uh, uh, g pipes uh, which is very significant very very significant when it comes to training and you'll see how fast uh, efficient net converges as well when I do the coding now. It, it converges really fast. Like uh, it took me 47 epochs on ResNet 152 to get uh, uh, results like 91%. But with efficient net uh, B4, which I ran where I got like 91.8, it converges in 11 epochs. So it's like there's a drastic difference. So I think we can go back to the code now, unless you want to ask something. All right. No, the only question I was asked um, in terms of um, widening the network uh, rather than deepening it, does that help when you're doing inference? Um, I'm thinking it, you would obviously be able to do more of the computation in parallel and rather than if you've got say 40 times as deep a network you you're one when you pass from one um layer to the next you you also have to complete the previous one before you move on that yes makes sense. Uh, sorry you're talking about inferences yeah the inference speed for wider rather than deeper i think i think you get a slightly higher performance from doing that Yes, we get like quite a significant performance change. Uh, the reason is uh, when we take when we wide so when we widen the network, so the the resource which we need more is memory, not the processing. Uh, we need more memory to get more feature maps. Uh, but but we, when we go from one layer to another with more feature maps, uh, the the I think. I might be wrong, but the GPU doesn't have to scale a lot uh, from going from one layer to another to do all those processings. It just have to get more memory. Uh, this is the paper and they, they did like some minor changes. This is a wide residual network came in 2017, which gave the idea like we can widen the network. And uh, they basically took the ResNet and just changed some things, but mostly the idea was you for you you increase the number of uh, feature maps by four times that's it uh they did change some of the things like in resnet uh, layers were like convolution layer then there was batch normalization and there was relu they switched like batch normalization convolution layers and relu but apart from it i think mostly things are same it's just uh they change uh the number of features uh I haven't read this paper. I saw a summary of this paper by a guy on YouTube. He mentioned it. So, uh, and he said the same thing, like uh, the performance, the, the only impact is on the memory. So if you have like a memory card, sorry, graphic card with higher memory bandwidth, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it trains faster because it, it takes less epochs and the network is smaller uh, to converge uh but but uh but the processing power uh decreases a lot yep uh we can i think i can go through this paper later uh i haven't read this paper though uh completely just just uh, to get an idea i went through it okay uh So 
right now i think the latest version of fast ai has some issue uh with uh torch by torch 1.5 release so what i was uh it, it like everything works fine but the transformation function especially rotation it creates some issues and the whole program just crashed so what i was doing like i was uh going back to the 1.4.0 torch and 0.5.0 torch version or you can download the latest dev uh code like dev branch from the github and it works fine as well but it creates some issues for me so I, 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 for now I'm working on 1.4.0 unless the new release comes up for fast AI or, or torch. Okay. Next, uh, what I like to do is I like to keep all my things in a folder directory called models, uh, or like any directory instead of, uh, keeping all the results in the like default place. So we should have our models here. We'll keep our results, our train models here and results as well. Next thing is your regular fast AI stuff. Nice. Then we need to download the data and untar it. But fast, this food 101 data set is already available with fast AI. So fast AI food data set. So we don't have to like go to the website and download from there. Uh, should give a link. Oops. Where is it again? Basically, we don't have to go to the link and untar. We just give this command untar underscore data and urls dot food so urls contain a lot of data sets we can just check all these data sets can wait card cypher cypher 100 Coco, all the popular data sets are there yes. so we take the food one and this food is just food one one data sets and it takes like five to six minutes so what i did i actually before joining the video i i, I ran this so I think it shouldn't take much time because it's already there. Yep. So basically it downloads the data sets like five to six minutes because it's five GB and then it untars it. So it takes like a 10 minute job. So we can see uh, what is there with us now. Oops. Mm, oh, sorry. Five yeah so we have images we have h5 file we have some text file json files now i all also have this data on my computer already so uh basically we get uh, this images folder where we have all the categories of data as in like uh, the name of the category as in folder and each category contains thousand food images and it contains some metadata and metadata contains uh, two JSON files and two text files, which contain out of all these data, which images are test images and which are train images. So it already comes with a distribution of test and train images. And if you see on the train images, so uh, uh, it just basically tells like out of like Apple pie, uh, the category is Apple Pan, uh, which image is uh, basically uh, is, is train image. All right. So because it instead like how usually fast AI likes data is uh, is like already distributed into train and test. Uh, but but uh, the whole data set here is just under one images category. So we need to do an operation so that uh, we get a data frame where uh, in this data frame, we, we get two data frames, train data frames and test data frame, which we can pass on to, uh, which we can pass on later to understand like, uh, which is uh, to tell fast air, which is the data, train data set and test data set. So it's basically just going into train text, uh, train dot txt and test of txt, and creating two columns, label and name, 
and under label and name is just telling like uh, the label is the first part of the string before the slash which was apple pie and name will contain the later part of the string which was the num na the name of the image which is a number so if we run it it should create two data frames so let's see train data frame dot head yep so it's saying it's label and this is the name apple pie slash this one down, dot jpg and similarly we have data for test uh, so now it will be easier for us to pass uh to fast yeah we just have to say like okay this is the test data this is the train data uh, with and first year will automatically pick the labels from this label category. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now, what I like to do is I got this code from somewhere in the Kaggle and it works really well. So, what we usually do is we seed so that to get the same results every time we, we uh, of the randomization. But when we do this, we usually do this only for uh, when we are creating the data and creating the split between the data, like out, out of the training set for every training, how much will be for train set and how much is for validation set. But when we use this, it actually also seeds a lot of other parameters, uh, which uh, like for torch, torch CUDA and backend CUDDN. Uh, just not just for NP random seed seed and it's it actually helps to generate the same images But still I see uh, You you don't get like exactly exactly the same data set results, but, but it's 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 very close to that Now what we are going to do uh, Today is we are going to train our model on uh, so we are going to try training this food 101 data sets on efficient net zero which is the smallest one and we'll do it for 224 uh, by 224 pixel and and we'll see how fast it converges and 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 so that we can also cover the training in this video and uh later we can see uh uh i have that notebook with me where i trained it on uh, for b4 with uh, 512 by 512 pixel and where we got the results better than b already available one so uh, let's define the batch size so batch size before will work fine and image size of uh, 224 and 224 uh, it's, it will work perfect now usually uh, when we do the training on if image classification problems uh, through fast AI and we have to do the transformation we use get transform function which we also used in some other 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 uh, this meetups we had and where we did image classification so we just use get transform and it gives you def default transform but what goes underneath is is we are doing basically this kind of stuff we are just telling like what kind of transformation we want and uh, for each transformation, like whether it's zoom, then we tell like how much should we zoom from like going from original size to 1.4 times. And other important thing is this P. So we is telling we are telling it's like on how much percent of the data, uh, like what's the probability that this zoom transformation should be applied. So I'm saying like to 75% of the data, it should be applied. So similarly, uh, this is one of the most important things I think, which were which helped me to beat the uh, current state of NAD was these transformations. So transformations are pretty important, and I think you have to play with transformation a lot. Uh, and I'm I'm applying a lot of transformations because this data set has. Uh, it's, it's not very clean data set. It has impurities and even when the classes are all right and images are like, okay, still uh, uh, there's like uh, some some images have like really bright, some images are really dark, somewhere food is inverted. It's like, it's very general data sets, like how we get in the real life uh, rather than uh, like satellite images. 
mages or something where only mages are kind of same. So transformation, uh, which I applied was most of the things were quite basic apart from brightness, contrast, uh, jitter, I applied skew and squish. We can go to the uh, fast AI website and, and a documentation and can see what all these uh, transformation do. Uh, but basically it's just uh, a minor change in, in colors or shape or, or basically yeah, flips and rotation. And you see it's, a, uh, if you see DF transformation, it has uh, like two elements in it. First is this, and the second is this. So the first one is for training. And second one we are saying like, uh, we don't want all these transformation for the validation set. Uh, only train set, you apply these transformation on the training set and for validation, we don't, we don't apply any transformation, just, uh, just a simple crop pad. Right, so uh, this is our transformation and then we can create our data, right. So, We are going to create a data from our image list, which is already a function with Pastia library. And from there we use from underscore df. We are creating from data frames uh, as we created two data frames above uh, here, train data frame and test data frame. And uh, so we just have to tell it which data frame are we talking about. So we are going to train on our uh, train data frames. Perfect. And where this train and where are the images? So we get path to the images. Path should be path equals to this. And oops. Yep. So you're saying like path equals to the default path, which is this slash images. And yep, and call this one, which is column one, where the images in the data frame. So column zero contains the labels and images are in column one. Perfect. And then we do uh, dot split. So we are telling like uh, how much on every training data should go in training set and how much should go in validation set. So train by a random person. Zero point two, and we have to tell like so we we told them where the images are, but we haven't told the should be all right. Yeah, we haven't told the data like where the labels are. So we do label underscore from data frame as well. But instead of column one, my labels were in column zero. So call equals to zero. And then what kind of transformations we want? Transform. So the transformation which we want is this. And what kind of size of the images we need. So size we already defined, which was 224. So all the images should be changed to size of 224 and transform to this kind of transformation, which I just mentioned. Perfect. And then uh, we have to define the, we create a data bunch out of it and we define the batch size. We have also declared the batch size above, which is 64. So we're just giving 64 value here. And finally, normalize. So what kind of normalization we want uh, for normalized American. Yeah. So we want HNET stats, the default one which comes with the image net normalization, but we can change to different normalization if you want. 
for now we'll use the image net normalization perfect should not get any error there is an error oh no that's a should be data frame perfect now comes the efficient net thing. So we have downloaded the data. Uh, sorry, we have uh, told the transformation and told like created a data bunch. Now, as I told you, this efficient net code is a third party implementation. Someone wrote it for PyTorch because the original paper, although it's like a uh, paper with code, they, they gave the code in the research paper, uh, they gave the source code, but they implemented it in, in Keras originally uh if you go on the git repo you can actually see and they ran, run it on tpu uh so what we are going to do so some guy actually implemented it in pytorch so he has the pytorch implementation and as i told you earlier it's quite simple uh, to import the libraries so, uh we are going to install so pip install uh Let's do it. If I already have, it. I ran this before in the same runtime. So, I touch. Perfect. And we should be able to install efficient at PyTorch using it. Yep. So, we have efficient net with us now. Uh, library. So we import the class from uh, efficient net firetorch import efficient net perfect. Now as I told you earlier uh, we can get the pre-trained one or non-trained one version of the efficient net and what kind of efficient net we want we also uh, we also tell here so into our variable called model we go like efficient net dot from pre-trained and efficient net b4 so we'll do b0 so that we can see the functioning of this here efficient net b0 yeah i think should be all right and Yep, it's being downloaded and as you can see the original pre-trained efficient net is very small, it's like 20 MB. Perfect. So loaded pre-trained weights for efficient net V0. Now, uh, it's just basically we are using the learner class. It's quite simple now from here on. So we are just telling we want accuracy and top five accuracy, we're interested in both. So we use both metrics. Uh, data we already defined here. We created the data one. Model is we just downloaded the efficient net pre trained model, which is V0. Uh, and we want the callback function to show us graph once uh, every time it gets trained. So we see the graph with validation loss, accuracy, and uh, training loss. And we are using uh, mixed precision. It's, it's one of those important things, I think, which helps a lot, mixed precision, because uh, what it basically does is like by default floating point, it takes 32 bits, bytes, bytes, sorry, uh, I forgot. <laughs> uh, by default, it takes 32, whatever. <laughs> and and we fast egg gives this provision, it's one of those libraries, which uh, gives you provision where you can train it on 16 bits instead of 32 bits. So what it does like everything on a graphic card just takes half the size and it helps you to train the model faster and with less RAM. And, and I, I haven't uh, worked with it a lot to see whether there's an impact on accuracy as well, but, but I have seen some blogs where people have mentioning like when they train it with mixed precision with a smaller, uh, floating point per season instead of 32 bit 16 bit, they get a slight accuracy improvement as well. Uh, I need to check that. I need, we, I need to read that about read about this a little bit more. But but I think it's one of those things. It's like pretty neat tricks uh, to train your model. 
So, and also uh, when we use uh, CNN learner, which we use for ResNet, the thing is uh, it by default breaks the network into three parts. So when we train our network, uh, it trains different part of the networks with different learning rates. Therefore, we give a slice when we do learn fit one cycle. So we give a slice. So we sell like the later part of the network, uh, which are the extra layers which we have added just for our model. The initial is just trained on the ImageNet competition. We don't want to change the initial layers a lot. We just want to make changes in the later layers. So we give higher uh, learning rate to the later layers and lower learning rate to the previous layers. But because it's a third party implementation and we, and we are using learner class, so it by default doesn't break our uh, efficient node, uh, efficient net model into the same way as it does for the ResNet. So we explicitly have to tell it that split, uh, uh, split our model and I just got it from internet. I don't know exactly how it's splitting the model so that it performs, it, it trains the model exactly like how we train our ResNet. So that it breaks the ResNet into two, into three, sorry, uh, it breaks the model into three parts and train uh, slowly on the earlier part of the network and faster on the later part. We don't have to do it in our CNN learner, but when we are using this learner class and we are using third party, we have to explicitly tell that you should split it the same way. Uh, uh, otherwise, it will work, but you will not get the same performance. Perfect. Let's go ahead. Cool. Uh, model is loaded. Uh, gives a good idea about the model. Now, next thing is we'll do a record plot to see what uh, learning rate we should use. And in the last meetup, I was talking about the suggestion equals to true, right? When like where uh, I was telling like it actually gives you the point which you should which you sh which you can use, and it's it's quite accurate. Uh, so let's see. I'd be interested to see how that performs on some of the more complicated. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> some of them, as a human, I look at them and I'm like, I don't know what. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it doesn't. It breaks, but like when it, it I, I never use it to be honest. Uh, I still uh, find my own points, but but uh, it's still a good indication. Like I give you an idea, so it's giving you this big red dot, right? So it's telling you like you should use minimum like nine e raised to the power of minus zero point three. It's saying like you should use this value, but I think I'm not going to use. It's it's all right. I can use that. Yeah, I'll use that. It, the curve is sharpest here. Instead of going, yeah, yeah, all right. I think it gives the perfect point right now. So <laughs> what I'll do is I'll make the learning rate equals to nine e raised to the power of minus three. Uh, and we do learn dot fit one cycle uh, with slicing as a copy paste the code so that I don't have to write much. <laughs> Uh, so should we, I think we, sh we should do it only once for now to see like how it is behaving and then, and let's save the results in the model directory we created. Yeah. So as I was saying, like we need the split. If we don't do the, uh, land or split, this slicing will not work. You'll get error here. It says like, uh, how are we going to splice, slice the network if there's no split in the network already? Cool. Okay, so our dot .pth file should go. And we should train our efficient at now. Yep. 
and each should train under 10 minutes. All right. It will take around 10 minutes from here. So in the meantime, I can show you the, uh, I open my book. The, one more thing, oops, sorry. No, don't say color. One more thing which I did, uh, which I skipped in this notebook uh, that I use in ResNet 152 that actually helped to improve the performance. And that is, okay, let's go to, yeah, ba ba yeah oh hmm. we don't have the images so basically what we do is fast ai has like a thing where you can create widgets within your notebook and you can actually interact with those widgets and these widgets are very helpful for cleaning the images which are misclassified or, or the images like similar images in the data set so i think once it is trained we can do it here as well but it will take some good eight minutes so what basically the idea is uh you just use fast air widgets you again create a new data bunch and this time you don't split the data set into training and validation set you said like split none so that takes all the data and then we take our model again and in, we use a, a class called data formatter and then we say like find out the top losses after uh, we did this one epoch of training so it, it tells us like what top losses are and then we just basically say like image cleaner and this is the part this is those images which are misclassified so and we get the images here and it says like, oh, it's takoyaki or not. And then it says like delete underneath it. This is still like, it's the UI still has some issues like this delete button is kind of hidden, but, uh, but, but it, it, you can basically see sometimes that there's a delete here with the red button and you can also change the class. So you think like, uh, this is not guacamole. What I see here is misclassified and this should be, uh, let's say pizza. So you should go and change the pizza. Or if you think like there's a, there's like an image of a human face and it says guacamole, so you can just basically delete it. What it does is when you, when you just go next batch, next batch, next batch. Uh, so it gives you a batches of six images every time and you go through this, it's kind of manual process, but it still helps you to remove some of those major anomalies and which, which helps you to improve the accuracy of your model. And it does help a lot. Uh, sorry and and you till the point where you see like three or four times when these new batches are coming it doesn't hear any problem and where this indicates that more most of those uh, batches which has issues have already been taken care of so now you don't have to press any button you just what it does like whenever you create a uh, create next batch a fast air automatically writes these changes where the database data set was changes or the class of the data was changed into a csv file called clean.csv in your default path and you just instead of creating the data bunch from uh, our default way of creating data bunch here we then create our data bunch from uh, this csv file that's the only change that happened so instead of using that data which was originally there we use this clean data So yeah, we are 50% there and we can see the uh, error rate went from seven to two point two percent And it's quite interesting because when I ran it for ResNet 152, uh, although it's a deeper model, but still uh, the convergence was not that, that quick. Uh, so training loss was 2.18 and 
like after the whole training session. And here, even like 50%, we are already lower than two. So it converges really, really fast. That's, that's, that's one of those quality of the vision. Net. Yep, I guess we have to wait three minutes unless <laughs> uh, you have something to ask for or No, sorry, we'll just edit it out in the video. <laughs> Fast <Sorry>. forward it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The helper functions do look really good. Um, we're probably, um, probably worth us having a look and seeing if there's any other useful ones that they've added in. Imagine the sure. documentation. Oh. Uh, what do you mean, like uh, the the models? Yeah, well, no, the helper widgets. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Because the, I know they've got the image downloader as well. Yeah. The there are some widgets, and I think he he mentioned in his videos that this is one of those areas of notebooks which people hasn't played around with a lot uh, because it kind of diverges from the main. Uh, idea like people usually use notebooks just to give command and get the results rather than not using it more interactively so he says like yeah it has a lot of potential if it is used properly we can create a lot of widgets and a lot of widgets can come up and like uh, i find this is pretty easy to clean the data than than uh, other ways of cleaning the data it is just quite impressive after this training, we can actually try uh, the cleaning with the widget, like some batches. I suppose one of the things though you won't want to do is um, remove the linear, less good images. Um, you, you probably want to keep those slightly more difficult to classify ones in there. You don't want to make it too easy for your model. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but uh, because this data set has so many problems already, so you'll, you'll be surprised to see like what kind of images are categorized as food here. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there's there's a teddy bear and it says like it's chicken wing. <laughs> like they, they, there's like a father and son image and, and they say the steak. It is, it can be, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not what a human would have said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so training is over. It should validate quickly. Less than a minute, two minutes. Running on the validation set. Uh, I guess I can increase the number of uh, the batch size. So what usually Colab does is when I do manage, it's not happening today. When I do manage session, it just tells me how much of the GPU is being Oh, sorry, I can do this with command level, but usually it shows here how much of the memory of the GPU is being used. So if it's like something like eight or nine GB and I have like 16 GB, I can increase the batch size. Otherwise I can run this command again and see how much of the GPU is used here. Initially it was just 10 MB, but well, it's more, it's better to use here. I think we can refresh the page and see here. Maybe it's it's not coming now. So the training happens faster if we increase the website. But again, I was uh, reading a blog yesterday 
that after one point, if you increase the batch size, uh, your accuracy, it, it impacts your accuracy. So 64 is actually a really good number, like below 64. The smaller you go on your accuracy, sorry, batch size, batch size it, it improves your accuracy. Otherwise, it actually impacts your accuracy if you go like uh, batch size of 200, 250, 300. Exactly. Oh, you might have... Does it not update the gradient after each of the batches? It does, but somehow there was some issue. Actually, I have that. I think I still have that blog. Yeah, well, it's just if you think of it, if you say you've got ten thousand images and you make each batch uh, a thousand, then you're yeah. you're only going to be updating your weights ten times. Yeah, true. But but uh, like, there's a big difference between thousand and sixty-four, right? So that guy took only sixty-four to two hundred. It is like three times. Uh, but he saw a big change in the uh, in the accuracy but going with the same thing i think then then uh, using the batch sizes of 8 or 6 should give us better results than 64 but uh, i don't think that works uh, like that perfect so we have our training done and we see just after one epoch of training, we are getting 72.8% accuracy uh, on the validation side and top five accuracy of 91.0%. And it's just one epoch. And on the ResNet 152, it, 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 I think after even after first, we were like 84 on this and 59 on this. Uh, so it, it converges really quickly, even like, uh, it, that's one of those benefits of efficient net. Uh, it's it's really fast, and there are versions of this. Like uh, there, oops, I don't know why it's not working. Yep. So that's the blog from the guy, and he gave some graphs where he's telling like how batch sizes, sixty-four, two fifty-six, and one zero two four dip performs differently. I think after sixty-four, it converges, and there is not a big change when we go from sixty-four to thirty-two or sixty. But yeah, I think it's a really long blog. It will take some time. Yeah, so training accuracy, 1024, 256, 64. They're pretty close. So I think going 32 or 16 uh, will be kind of same. But... Uh, it's interesting that they were converging on different points as well. Yeah, yeah. Even I was surprised. I haven't read this book because it's like a book. <laughs> this guy wrote a lot. <laughs> but uh, uh, the graphs, they had some interesting results. Uh, because I, I was wondering, like, so what So what he did, like, he took the batch size, more, like, bigger batch size, but then he increased the learning rate, and he found out that actually this moved closer. Uh, so if you are using bigger batch size, then use higher learning rate and, and things will start to get better. And, and I, I have no clue how it works and why it should work, but, but it, it works. I suppose hmm. that makes sense. If you're making less updates to your parameters, then you um, need to make the updates a little bit bigger. Sorry again. I was just saying that if you're making fewer updates to your parameters, then um, you it, it would make sense that to achieve the same or similar result, you need to make bigger updates at each step. Mm -hmm. No, why, why will you say that? Because like it's if you're taking bigger changes, like we, we're taking bigger steps. Well, if you yeah, yeah, say, yeah. for instance, you've got 10 times as many updates because you've got a 10 times smaller batch size, you're, you're going to make 10 times as many movements on the on adjustments true. to your weights. So if true, you, true, true, yeah, got it. Uh, if you use the same learning rate, even if it's all, all the shifts in the weights are moving in the same direction, you're, you're going to get much, much more reduced yep, change. Yep, yep, makes sense. I've got it. I actually was thinking through.
some other way. For example, like if you're jumping like only 10 times, then we know need those 10 times to be big steps. Correct. Uh, you want me to run the widget? You want to try the widget? Yeah, let's do that. Otherwise, yeah, so what I'll do, I'll, oops, I'll use, keep this here. Right. So fast AI widget, import stuff. And as I said, like we don't want the split this time. So we create a new data set and we say to it like, all right, uh, labels here. So we're doing split none and everything is kind of same apart from normalization. So we're not also normalizing. Okay, the new data set. Perfect. And then we use the same learner. But on the new data, so the data value is updated, everything else will remain same. So the data bunch is changed. Yep, no issues with that. And now we use a so. And now we have already trained it on one epoch. So we use this to load the learner. So whatever we have learned, we'll load that back into our model to see, we have to see the top losses on whatever we have learned already. So I usually like to do like three epochs and then see top losses on, on after three epochs, but uh, it works fine with even one epoch. So it will get an idea of some images which will be totally off and which will have like a loss value of really high. So, We'll do dot load and we'll just copy part and paste in here. Oh, sorry, we don't give dot pth. All right, so we have loaded uh, this epoch which we learned the model, and then finally we just use top uh, data formatter dot top classes on it. Top losses, sorry, not top classes. And we just replace the line here. Perfect. Uh, I guess it will take some time. It's going to take around seven minutes to go through all the data again. So I think it's kind of like another epoch. It's going through all the data, but without normalization and split and checking out what were the top losses uh, with this train model. So, okay, we can come to it again. And meanwhile, I can, you can see if I did some of the changes to my notebook as well or not, so that I'm not missing on anything. Efficient net B4. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. It's kind of same, same. So after three epochs on B4, uh, we were talking about 84% accuracy, 96. Here, yeah, then I cleaned the data. And then, yeah, one more thing that I found, I, it's one of those things which, which if someone wants to write a research paper, <laughs> is uh, I found dropout really interesting. Like, uh, when I was doing ResNet, let me bring it back. So usually what I find like the way I train my models, like they go fine. Uh, my, my validation accuracy is a uh, valid loss is lower than my training loss. Then it will become same. Then I train, started training on five by two, 512 by 520, but it doesn't converge. Like I'll, if my training loss is over my validation loss, it's mean I'm underfitting my model. And uh, like there are so many things already like dropouts and things which it help us to uh, create the balance between uh, 
uh, like to not go overfit our model. But for underfit, we we all I always get the issues. So I always end up underfitting the model. I don't know why. Uh, so this shouldn't be up than this at the end. This should be below it always. So I've tried like a lot of Apex as well, and and also I played around with uh, dropouts a bit. So either you take a lot of uh, lot of Apex and 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 let it converge, but after one point I figure I found out like it doesn't converge at all. Uh, it just stays same, and uh, but we can do two things either we can change weight decay or we can change dropouts uh both of these do help a bit but for efficient net uh, uh like when we do dropout so you see i'm changing the value of dropout here so i'm changing ps 0.2 so i'm changing when cnn learner it's for resnet 152 which i use so when i use that i'm telling like only do dropout on 20 percent of the values and also dropout works very like for the model uh, for the layers which which came or pre-trained uh, i think the dropout is 0.25 and the dropout on the layers which were created for just for our uh, problem is 0.5 percent and uh, so we can change this dropout value and it does go down but I found a pattern like when we increase or decrease the dropout, just how we change the learning rate, there, there is a change in performance. So uh, I think it's something uh, if someone wants to like uh, try and see whether it, it, this theory works or not. So change dropout just like learning rate uh, slowly uh, with, or every time you train with new epoch. And I think it does improve the performance. So for now, fast I just do two values like 0 0.5, 0 0.25. So it's one of those things if you want to try and and want to write a paper, uh, maybe it will work. Maybe it is a little work. So it's just one of my theories. So I, I might give it a go uh, after my efficient thing is over. Uh, but uh, it only I can only do it with the CNN learner class. By default, the learner class in fast AI doesn't give this. So there's nothing like PS here. So because it's third party, so I think I have to write by myself uh, some imp some add-ons into the code to see whether I can do the dropout so that my model doesn't underfit first of all, and and just try these values uh, so that it goes down with each epoch, each epoch uh, and and I can see the results whether what I'm thinking works or not. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the conclusion we all um, came to when we looked at it last time, is that it does seem to be the uh, combination of the efforts um, built into it to stop us overfitting um, was what was causing us to um, achieve worse um, training um, results than we were getting in validation because you were removing all the dropout and it, it, you were allowing it to work using a, a static network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but again, the, 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 what I'm saying is like, instead of dropout being just two static values, which, which, which Jeremy says like, he has done a lot of experiments and the best value he found was 0.25% for ResNet and 0.5 for the later layers. But I think uh, instead of being like one static value, is they can around with and find out like, uh, whether we see a performance jump or not. And I th think there could be a performance change uh, if we play around with these values. Instead of being static values, they change with the epoch just that we slice the network and do learning rate. Like we would use different learning rates with each epoch. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. <clears throat> like after some time and see, I'll tell you whether it worked or not after this efficient net thing. Okay, so it should be perfect. Now, 
Okay, we have that. I think we just have to do just one command, which is image clear. Image cleaner, sorry. Uh, should get those stop losses. Perfect. So does this look like a garlic bread? Uh, can be. These are not scallops, for sure. Devil egg, true. Well, it's a scallop, but it's been baked with cheese on it. Ah, uh, okay. It's, uh, it's in the shell. <laughs> <laughs> I think everything is all right. Uh, we can't, even this, these are escargots, but, but we can't see them. Those snails will be inside. <laughs> Deviled eggs uh, are being a bit cartoonish. <laughs> yeah. Next batch. Sushi, dumplings. This is not chicken wings. No. <laughs> this is hot dog. If it is something is closest to it, so you can do hot dog. Uh, lasagna. This is not strawberry shortcake. This is some weird stuff. But even then, like, we, we these are still closed. But there are like some images in the of it. I think because we just trained, uh, that's why I do like, I like to do it like for three epochs. And then, then the uh, training losses are a little more obvious. Still, uh, it's not there. But uh, you should see those very weird results. This is not cheesecake. This is ice cream. This is not onion ring. This is some chips like this is totally weird this is not fish and chips <laughs> this is not taco yeah so it, it helps to clean those things this is not mac and cheese this is not pizza yeah all right uh, that's uh, interesting how about such fun is that Definitely going to Sorry? start using. Thanks for showing us that. I'm definitely going to start using some of these. It, it does actually. I think I got. Um, I did did some manual work to be honest when I was trying. So I I went 200 batches. It took me half an hour. So like this is one batch. We go to another batch. This is like second. So I did like 200 times. Uh, and I think I got one percent accuracy change just by doing all that. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, so let's let's say like we made some changes, uh, and then we sh we should be able to create a data bench data bunch from the clean ravioli. These are not pancakes; these are waffles. This is garlic bread, nachos. These are oyster uh, oysters. Cool. Uh, and now we should be able to. Okay, if we see part dot ls, we have clean dot csv now here. It is added, and it just have those changes which we just made. So instead of creating data data bunch from data frames, what we'll do, we create the data bunch, but from CSV. I give the path, or we say like valid percentage is 20%, and we give clean.csv instead of giving the data frame which is using, rest everything remains same. Like transformations, which we defined earlier, will remain the same, and normalization. And also I, uh, there's a thing here we with with image data bunch from CSV that we can add. It's called number of workers. So if you see the first command I course I have, CPU cores two. I think by default it doesn't use all the cores to create data bunch, but I can tell it like okay, use both of my cores to create data bunch. Uh, so you check like how many cores just give four, so it will happen quickly. Uh, if you have like a lot of data and it takes time to create it, although it doesn't take much time to create data and stuff. So it's not a major, major time saver. Yep. I think that's, uh, that's 
doesn't look good. What happened? Cont ah, okay. So it's not clean. Dot our part is not right. Perfect. So we have the data. So I think the rest is just same training on uh, just finding a perfect point and optimizing it. And the 10 to 11 efforts, it, 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 it converges really well. So if I can show you my efficient net, we want to yeah. yeah. So I will to get 91.71% accuracy with TTS. So yeah, one more thing that, so without TTA, I was getting 9.22, 98.63, and with TTA, 91.7. So what is TTA do uh, is when we make predictions, either we can make prediction on the directly the test images straight up, or uh, there are some techniques through which while making prediction, you can increase the accuracy. One of those thing, one of those techniques is called tan crop. What what we do in tan crop is we give the test image, and we make tan crops out of it at different regions, and we <clears throat> we make the probability estimate on all those regions, and we take the best values like which value was mostly there. We're, again, np dot argument x. Or what we can do is something called TTA, which is inbuilt in uh, fast AI. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the whole data set again, loading my model, and uh, I'm just saying that instead of making prediction straight up, first you do TTA. So TTA is doing those transformation on the test set again, which I did for training. So it creates several copy of the image, which, uh, uh, which we want to predict value on. And on those several copies, so let's say I, I did all those transformations, uh, all these transformations. So uh, if I give a image of pad thigh, so it will uh, do, do all these transformation on pad thigh. So it will create several copies and will make prediction on all these copies and will then decides based upon the results which it gets, like what was the maximum value which it got. And based upon that, we actually get a performance increase again. So I was able to get 91.71 and it is just on B4. Uh, I am running B7 right now, but uh, uh, it is it is a heavy job. And I think fast air doesn't support multi GPU still yet, multiple GPU support. So I can't run it on uh, AWS or somewhere where they have two P3s or two V100, sorry, two P100, so two V100, so three V100s combined together so that I can run it in a shorter period of time. But uh, uh, it will take me, I think, several days of training. Fast AI, I, I read somewhere, I might be wrong, that Fast AI does support multiple GPUs, but I think Fast AI doesn't support what I read, multiple GPU training yet. Yep, and yeah, it's still being trained right now. And the, the clean data which I created using B4, I'm using in the B7, I'm not cleaning it again. So it, it just saves me a lot of time. And till then. So I think that's pretty much it, what I needed to cover, wanted to cover. Next thing from here that, uh, which I think can improve performance on this is dropout, uh, because uh, there was no dropout. So I want to, because my model is still underfitting, so I think oops, if I can get this closer by changing the dropout value, how I did for ResNet. Uh, so for that, I think I need to implement some, if someone wants to implement something in the main third party implementation of fast, uh, efficient net with this guy. Uh, or use the other version of efficient net, which I have available now. So they are uh, a newer version of efficient are now available. They are called fix sufficient small minute changes and and I think the current state of an art for uh, for uh, image net competition is fix sufficient net. Paper with code. Let's go there and we we'll just quickly see whether what was the current best classifier for image classification. I think it's efficient net where 
with some fix to it. Yep, fix efficient at L2. So this is the paper where if, so the current leader on ImageNet data set is yeah, efficient. Net. But the B4 and B7 are like, B7 is on 23rd now. So they're like a lot of, uh, like this B7 is 26th, lot of changes to efficient net has already been made. Oops, sorry, we were looking, my net is slow. B6, B5, efficient net B5 is on 40th. So I ran it on B4. So I think if I run just simply B4, I should be top 50 before was again 51th on MHNet competition. But now same efficient net people have made a lot of changes to it, like some tweaks to it. And this one is the best one. And I think it came last month. Uh yeah, I think that's it. Unless you have some more questions. Oh, that was really great, Michelle. Um, um... I guess the only thing to say is, are you able to share your notebooks um, on the Slack channel? Yeah, I'll say I'm still running and I don't know uh, whether, how much, how long will it take? It'll take two, three days of training because I just do like three epochs and it takes 11 hours. But good, a good thing for me is like it just takes 16, it will take around 15 to 16. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll share my B4 one. Yeah, and I'm also thinking of writing a blog because going a paper, but uh, it can be a really good blog. So, uh, as well, when I write, like what all things I did. Cool, all right, look forward to that. Right, should we close up the recording and um, we can all get our dinners? Cool. Thanks again, Vishal. Cheers. That was brilliant. Thanks very much. No worries.